welcome to On Fighting in Thailand, best news and analysis covering the economics and infrastructure of Muay Thai. I'm Matt Lucas, journalist, commentator, and ex-Muay Thai fighter. Make stronger fighters, make stronger people. So this episode has me interview Greg Wooten from the UK. He's now relocated to Los Angeles where he's training and teaching full time. He's retired UK fighter, very, very accomplished as some big wins in his career. Uh, for example, his bout with Pet Bunchu, who we talk about in the episode. Greg is a great guy, has done a lot of good things for the sport. Um, so I'm excited to talk to him. Again, this is a little bit of a late release. Uh, just been traveling a lot. My tour in the States went on a bit long. And also it had me a little delayed with some of my other regular projects. I hope to get back on the horse with everything. So without further ado, the interview with Greg Wooten. So thank you, Greg, for coming on the show today. I really appreciate you taking your time out. How are you doing? I'm good. Yeah, I'm very well, thank you. And uh, no problem. Thanks for having me on. It's nice to be considered uh, worth interviewing. <laughs> Great. Yeah, well, you've had a very storied career. You know, later on in your career, you fought uh, Pet Bunchu, beating him. Um, I think you knocked him down in the first or second round, correct? Yeah, yeah, the first first round yeah uh we'll definitely talk about that and you've also traveled internationally obviously you're based in america now uh but how did things first get going for you you started at 16 years old correct yeah that's right yeah mm -hmm. um so yeah before thai boxing <clears throat> i was mostly playing football or what americans call soccer and um up until about 14 I stopped playing that and I and I, I tried a little bit of taekwondo but um didn't really get into it. Um there just there's a lot of pad work and, and patterns and cathodes and stuff which was which was great, but I think I just wanted something more practical. And then I flirted with a little bit of boxing. I went to a local gym which was a little bit too uh practical. <laughs> so there was no technique work, it was just straight kind of sparring and getting your head punched in every session. Um so that was uh, the, the the other end. And then I had a friend who was doing Thai boxing. Um, so he took me along to train at um, Damien Faulkner's. Uh, he was my initial coach for a few months at a local community center in West London in Hammersmith. From there, he suggested a go to the gym that he was fighting from, which was KO Gym in Bethnal Green. So he, he suggested me and my friend go down there for extra training. I walked through the door and straight away there was people sparring and, and uh it was so practical, and uh, it was a full-time gym, full-time facility, and um, yeah, I I really enjoyed it and clicked with it, and it made me want to learn. So I, I stayed there my whole uh, fight career. And you started at 16, so that was maybe 15, 20 years ago, correct? Yeah, that's right. Uh, 15, about 15 years ago, yeah. Um, so what was the uh, Muay Thai scene like in the UK at that period that was so 15 years ago is maybe... Uh, around 2000, 2006, correct? Yeah, yeah. Um, so the scene then, um, like very soon after I started training, I ended up helping out on the show and I was like uh, behind the cameraman. I, as the cameraman walked backwards, I was I was coiling up the cable. And uh, so I saw my first show in York, in York Hall, yeah, which is the home of boxing in London, um, and it was main event was Stephen Wakelin versus Chowatana. Um, what's his name? Was it Tall Range? Yeah, Lam Sam Kran, probably. Yeah, yeah, yeah Lam Song Lam Song Kran, Lam Song Kran Chowatana, and uh, that one blew me away, man. Because Stephen was always I didn't know I didn't know either of them, but Lam, Lam Song Kran just mean, tall, rangy. I think he broke Stephen's orbital with the elbow. He was just frightening, and he looked like bullets would bounce off him. He was so uh, so strong. Obviously, the rest of the fight, there wasn't any other top ties on the bill, so that one really stood out, and that one kind of blew me away a bit. So I was in in awe watching that. There was Stephen Wakelin, uh, one of my coaches uh, and mentors, David Paquette, was fighting at the time. He fought Sam Cor, 
uh, not too long before that. He um, he then went on the Contender Asia not not too long after that time, and that was like a huge huge thing to see someone I knew on that show and with all these big names and stuff. And he had a great fight with Jazza, Jabba Askarov, and they had a rematch in the UK. Then there was like Stephen Wakelin. Um, <clears throat> he'd previously fought John Wayne Parr, like, and he was fighting top names. Um, Julie Kitchen was doing her thing, claiming titles left, right, and center, I think, at that time. Uh, there was Richard Fenwick was another big name. There was uh, Christian Knowles was fighting. Christian Knowles, he, he fought, uh, he had some really big fights with... Um, Dillian White, uh, I remember those. Daniel Sam was another big name. So then in the north, Liam Harrison was he was smashing it. He was I think he was pretty young then, and obviously he he started fighting top top level very early. So he was having huge fights and uh, Andy House and all the bad co guys and yeah. So that was kind of the the scene. Yeah, how often were the fights? How often were you going to see them as well? Yeah, there was a lot of shows. Um, I didn't uh, initially didn't start traveling up and down the country it was quite it was fairly there's a fair, like fairly big segregation between the north and the south in the uk back then northern shows and southern shows and there wasn't a lot of in between it got uh, there was more dan green started putting on oh yeah there was the muay thai legends so so muay thai legends in london and then they started having uh liam liam fought sanchai um damien and andy Housen had another the, i can't remember which number fight but they had another fight there so uh, there was a lot of local shows going on. Crawley, Lumpini Crawley were putting on shows. Alan, Alan Kedal was putting on shows. My my old coach, Bill Judd, was putting on shows. Like, there was a lot of local gym shows, yeah. And then there was interclubs, real, like, loads of interclubs as well, or smokers, um, as they're called in the States. So um, it seemed, uh, again, maybe it was because I was fresh, but it seemed like there was a lot of going on. And then personally, when did you start fighting? When did you first enter the ring? How did that work for you? I think I start, had my first smoker after Interclub after about um, maybe four to six months. Yeah, I did a smoker. And then I did a couple of those quite quickly. And then I got an opportunity after about nine, ten months uh, to do a C-class fight uh, without shin pads. So then, and then I just started rolling with it after that, fighting fairly regularly every six to eight weeks kind of thing, uh, the first couple of years anyway. Um, and then there was also <clears throat> the opportunity to fight on the IFMA, the IFMA circuit. So um, I think when I was 16 or 17, I went to the European Games and it was in um, Poland, it was in Poland that year. And then a year or two later, maybe two years later, I went to the World Championships in Bangkok. So I, I really learned loads from the IFMAs, actually. Um, now it's in the Olympics, but before, back then, it was like a great opportunity to see all these other different national teams, the way they carry themselves, to be in a professional environment, to be in a tournament, to have to make weight every every time you fight, you make weight. So you have to keep your weight down throughout. And it was a, yeah, it was a very quick learning curve different styles different approaches so that was um that was really really good experience and in terms of uh time period you were on the ifma teams uh in 2008 2009 yeah i was on the i went to the ifma world championships 2009 and i think the europeans back in 2007 i think those were the two yeah i fought in a couple couple uk qualifying bouts as well that was it really mm. And what do you think you maybe specifically learned from some of those IFMA events? I know you said, you know, just a professional atmosphere, but were there certain things in bout or out of bout that you learned? Yeah, definitely. Cutting weight. So all the Eastern European teams, I, I, I don't fully understand the system, but from what I do understand is that they, they're required to represent their country. So they would have top fighters like Andre Kulabin and Andre Kotsor for Belarus um artem levin for russia and they would have all their top guys would be representing i think because if they didn't they wouldn't get paid i think they were being paid or something but so these guys uh, obviously they're fighting at top level mm -hmm. cutting weight they were just professional so i remember like for example turned up to one i think it was the european championships kazakhstan pulled up on a coach and all of their guys jumped off with sweatsuits on started moving around start working up a sweat um and that was the evening before the first weigh-in. So they were cutting weight. That was probably their first bit. And then they probably cut more weight overnight or in the next morning. And um, they were, everyone was tall for the weight. 
everyone was lean. Um, so that level of professionalism, how to carry yourself around opponents. So uh, like a lot of the Eastern European teams would be very uh, stoic around you until, uh, unless they, like say, if you if they knew you were out of the competition, very friendly, but if you were still in the competition, maybe fighting one of their teammates or fighting them, it was just good, uh, just sportsmanship, professionalism. I think, yeah, just just learning how to uh, be in the atmosphere uh, all day long. So you're in the in the tournament for your friends or for whatever, and um, become more accustomed to it. So you know, adrenaline, all these stress hormones coming through. Seeing different fighting styles, each team each each team had different fighting styles. Seeing which ones works, trying to analyze and guess. It was a bit of a guessing game each tournament as to the scoring system. So uh, if was when I first went, it was it was a body shield and a head guard, elbow pads and shin guards, the foam shin guards. So because the body shield, it was quite a, like you, there wasn't you couldn't hurt your opponent as much as when there wasn't. So. Mm -hmm. The body shield meant that there was a lot of quick, quick kicking, scoring, score, 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 move around. So the first time I went there, I think since then the body shield has been removed. So it's, a, it's slowed down. I think they've changed also from four two minute rounds to three three. Correct. So yeah. So when that happened, there was more of a focus on power, dominating, and it became more uh, professional in, in in those senses. Mm -hmm. And then uh, were there other notable fighters on the team as well? Yeah, yeah. Um, oh, I think I went to two world championships, actually. So uh, one of them there was Julie Kitchen was on the team. Mm. Uh, Anna Zuccelli from, from my gym, she ended up, uh, I think in the IFMAS, yeah, she ended up fighting Yeah, Joanna from USC. Joanna... Um, the famed did well and got a medal and then went into UFC. I, I know who you're talking about. I also can't pronounce her last name, so... <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> so Anna, Anna Zuccelli ended up fighting her like three times. Amanda Kelly, she fought Valentina Shevchenko. Uh, she fought her. That was a real tough fight. When she Again, it was kind of crazy because at that time, Amanda had had maybe eight to 10 or 12 fights. Oh, not Valentina that much. Yeah. No, not that much at all. And then Andre Kulabin was there, Artem Levin. Uh, when they went to the World Championships, Miriam Nakamoto was there for USA. Uh, Gaston mm. Balanos was there for USA. He was young at the time as well. So yeah, there were some some good people. Yeah, for sure. And then, so you moved back. You went back to the UK, of course, and continued your career. Uh, what you and you fought basically all over the UK, correct? Yeah, yeah, I fought uh, or on a variety uh, yeah. of different shows. Yeah, a variety of different shows. Yeah, mostly around the London area. I fought up in Carlisle. Yeah. Uh, in and around that area, yeah. What what were some of the notable shows at the time, and what was it like fighting for the different shows? Yeah, it was fighting on Dan Green's Legend Show in Croydon, Fairfield Hall. So that, they were big shows because they had Liam versus Sanchai. I fought on that um, undercard. I think there were some um, Somrak versus Kieran Kedel. Uh, I don't, I can't. I think maybe I fought on that show or I went to that show. That was another big one. That was happening. Then there was the Master Skin uh, Academy. So MSA. There was MSA shows. I can't remember what, what it was, actually. Master Skin Academy. But yeah, he then put on some shows, uh, which I fought uh, Panacos Yusuf on, and then Borkow for uh, Jordan Watson. So he came over. So that that was they were they were quite big shows at the time, like to have big names coming. And then I fought on um, my own coach's show, um, Bill Judd, so David Paquette fought for a world title against an Italian, uh, Saro Presti. Um, Arnold Borotov, who's another uh, sort of teammate um, from, a, from a sister brother gym or sister gym, bloodline gym. So he, he was fighting on his way up there before he started. He switched to kickboxing full time. So the shows, yeah, it, it, was, it was good to be fighting on those shows on undercards of, of quite big names. Um, yeah, Damian Trainer versus Andy Housen was a was a great fight yeah so it was uh it was a it was a good time i mean you said a couple you know you listed off some pretty substantial fights like jordan versus bukau of course uh damien and andy had a couple fights uh were there any bouts and you fought uh pancios who is he's still active today too correct yeah he fought a couple of weeks back yeah panicos i think he's one signed to one championship yeah um 
So were there any sort of standout fights for you in terms of your own career uh, fighting on some of these undercards and also some of the bigger ones, the headliners? Yeah, yeah. Um, I think it was like my fifth or sixth fight. I fought Paul Kapowitz uh, from Master Skin's gym. And that was on that was the undercard of the Contender Asia tournament. So the qualifiers. So we, there was a qualifying tournament which Jordan Watson won. Uh, they didn't actually run a second series. I think it then became Infusion took over, and then he fought on that later on. Um, but um, so that was a big fight for me because it was my first A class fight, so full full rules rules fight. Um, Paul Kapowitz was Master Sken's uh, prodigy, his student uh, from the north of the country. I was, I was my coach's Bill Judd's student from the south of the country. So with the north-south divide and rivalry, that was quite a uh, two up-and-coming guys. Paul had fought another really good fighter called um, John Dennis, and they'd had a really good fight. So Paul was, yeah, that that was exciting. Uh, he was so he was very he, he's a super talented guy, man, and. If you only need to watch his training videos and his thing to see, he's got a very unique and creative style. So we fought on that one. Um, I won that fight. I just kind of scored, pressured, put him into the clinch and, and controlled him in the clinch. Uh, and then he was practicing a lot of spinning elbows as soon as I was trying to clinch him. And he caught me 30 seconds before the end of the fight, uh, just beneath the eye. And my eye closed straight away. Um, so that was kind of lucky. It happened just before the end of the fight. Uh, so that was a big fight uh, for me because yeah, North East South, both up and coming, uh, up and coming guys. And Paul is still active as well. At least he does a lot of social media. Or he's part of the Warriors Collective online stuff. Yeah, he's done. Yeah, he's done some tutorials on the Warrior Collective. He fights probably once or twice a year because he runs his own gym, too technical in the Manchester area. Mm. We actually fought on the same show in the States, the uh, Muay Thai in America, the second one. So we got to know him there and he's, he's a lovely guy, man. He's a, he's a very uh, good guy. Uh, he's still fighting. It's quite incredible really because he runs his own gym and he'll come out once or twice a year and have a really high level fight against uh, good opponents. Uh, Paul's still active. Panakos Youssef is still active, who I fought. Um, another big fight for me was um, Luke Turner. Uh, who was training and fighting out of Bad Company at the time. So Luke Turner had won a world title by stopping Andre Kotsour, so the Belarusian, and he'd uh, stopped him with a, an elbow. Um, he had taken that fight at like a day's notice, so that was a huge win for him. I think he'd won another title against a Swedish guy, an ISKA title, and he was fighting with, and he was training and out of Bad Company with all the, at the, at the time, they had a very strong stable. They had, uh, obviously, Liam, Jordan, Watson, Andy House. And they had Imran Khan. They had Davey Mack, the Scottish fighter. They had, um... It wasn't Stephen Melody. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, I don't know if he was I, there I don't think then, he was there then, was, but I, I know uh, the Badger fellow you're talking about. James France, James France, that's his name. Yeah, James. So he had they they hit. So that was a big fight because um, um, my coach was trying to set up a fight with Liam Harrison. So Bill was trying to get me onto the level where I could was credible enough to fight Liam. And so I think they'd agreed with uh, Richard Smith that if I fought Luke and beat Luke, I would have earned the right to fight Liam down the line. And so that was a stepping stone. And Luke was, uh, we had very similar records. We both spent about a year in Thailand or, or the best part of a year. Um, we both uh, had similar records. We'd won a world title by that point. And uh, we had a good fight. Um, he kind of dominated the first two rounds, I think. Threw me all over, gave me a big old spear elbow, cut me in the second round. And then um, changed the strategy a bit, went to more kicking. I think uh, I gave him a big elbow in the fourth. Uh, and then, uh, yeah, I took it on points. So that was a good, um, that was a quite a big domestic one and a, and a turning point. So, yeah, not you know, a huge turning point, but just a big test, actually, I think, for for both of us. Yeah. And you did, did you end up fighting Liam at some point or it didn't end up working out? No, it, we were scheduled to fight um, on the main event. So the main event was a good, good really good promotions uh, by Daz Morris and Phil Shedden, and they had some. Um, can't remember how many did they did, but they did some good shows. Very good production. 
I fought on another one against, yeah, Rungrat Sassy Prapper. Um, but uh, uh, so myself and Liam were supposed to fight. And then the day of the weigh in, I think Liam had a uh, kidney infection or something happened while he was cutting weight. So maybe I think uh, when you're when you're dehydrating um, the kidney and it gets put under a lot of stress, so something happened there. He got taken to hospital and um, uh. so he didn't make the weight or whatever. So the fight the fight didn't happen. Uh, but that was yeah that was that was supposed to happen. Um, but going back a little bit, you said that you'd spent some time in Thailand already by the time you fought Luke Turner. Um, you spent about a year at Kipon Tip, correct? Yeah, yeah. I spent about uh, not not quite a year actually. I spent seven months or so. So yeah, I, mm -hmm. it was my uh, gap year before I went to to, to study at university. So mm -hmm. I worked in a supermarket, Marks and Spencers. I worked in uh, M and S for uh, <laughs> a few months <laughs> on the checkout. I was a, I was a checkout girl for a bit, um, checkout boy for a bit, and then I saved up enough money. And then my coach was also helping me out to stay out there long enough. And um, Rob Cox and Miss Tar and the, and the nice, the really nice people at Cap on Tip, they gave me a discounted rate, which allowed me to stay there for a bit longer. And um, they were super accommodating really good um gave me again learned how to train like a professional twice a day through like you know the thai style training uh i learned so much about the clinch there um my trainers there mr liam was a huge influence on my guard changing style he had me changing guard quite a lot mm -hmm. um omnoy was an uh, incredible clincher and sam pry was a uh, very very flashy lovely style uh, so they so there was a lot of um also at the time there was um Samson Kyat Kon Chao. So he, at the time when I first got there, he was Rajadam Nun and Thailand's champion. So uh, being to train and watch how the way that he trained and how hard they worked, it was it was a huge, uh, huge, hugely beneficial experience. And also Rob Cox is just an encyclopedia of knowledge. So just being around Rob and being able to sort of pick his brain on things and. Um, and also because he's obviously he's from the same city and same sort of part of the city as me, um, it was great to also have him who fully he fully understands what what I'm coming from and how to sort of match make correctly and make sure I'm safe and yeah he looked after me really well so I'm really really grateful for those guys. Yeah, so just following up on a couple of those things, um, one when were you there? It was maybe 2011, 2012. Um, I think it was, uh, I went, when I fought in the uh, IFMA World Championships in Bangkok, I flew there, trained a little bit for two weeks or so, and then fought in the championships. And then I stayed and I stayed. So that was 2009. So I think sort of back end of 2009. Um, Into 2010. Yeah, so. yeah, yeah. And then you said, uh, you know, specifically in sort of a technical question that Mr. Liam, who is still with the gym, uh, helped you change your guard. Can you sort of explain that a bit more? Yeah. So um, before I got to Kiat Pong Tip, um, David Paquette, uh, he, he was one of my coaches as well. He, he was my, he'd sort of taken me under his wing while he was still fighting or coming to the end of his career. So he'd started, I can't remember, I think I had an injury or something. So he had started to train me in a bit more southpaw. And then, um, then I went to thailand and mr liam maybe picked up on this and then he had me doing quite a lot of guard change and stance change stuff mm, okay. um so he was a big influence with that and then also later on down the line i had a training partner um leon leon williams or leon wills he was uh not as experienced as me at all but um he had trained with some of his friends at fight factory carbon with lucy and carbon so he was bringing a bit of that influence, and he actually helped train me a lot for um, the last few fights I had. I guess. So he trained me quite a lot for a uh, Pet Boon Chu fight, and um, his influence as well. So between the three of them, David Paquette, uh, Mr. Liam, and then obviously Bill Judd had given me all the foundation, and then uh, sort of I just picked up bits along the way. So that sort of, they all influenced my style. And then you also talked a bit about uh, Rob sort of telling you things obviously at that point rob ha was very very active in the stadiums always taking photos i think he was doing some commentating at lumpini at the time so what sort of specific things do you think you learned from him um at that time yeah i think 
first of all, coming over and trying to, uh, because I'd only ever um, experienced Thai boxing in the UK. So to understand the gambling culture was a big, uh, takes a while. To understand mm -hmm. the way that the rounds are structured, the weighting of the rounds, the sort of tempo of the fight, um, different styles and different gyms. So there was a lot to understand that Rob was really, uh, took his time to, to explain. We'd watch fights maybe in his gym or, or uh, uh, we'd go to the stadiums and he'd be commentating or taking pictures and then we'd chat about it afterwards. But he would explain to me sort of the differences and then um, how to fight and uh, same, yeah. So it was just a lot of uh, absorbing knowledge there. And he knew, he knows everybody. He knows all the fighters from wherever. So you could fire questions at him and he, he'd, he'd, he'd know who they were, what their style was and whatever. So, um, so it was just really big adjustment into sort of like the weighting of the rounds, the scoring, the, uh, what the judges are looking for, what they're not, um, uh, visual effects. Yeah. So kind of that adjustment, whereas in the UK, uh, you know, we don't fight full tie rules straight away. So, you know, you free two minute rounds, people come out all guns blazing and it's, it's scrappy and this and that. But, um, so, so, just uh, learning, uh, learning Muay Thai in the homeland was Rob was really good for for that. Yeah, and you mentioned also that he was very helpful with some of the matchmaking. You fought at sixty three kilos, which is a competitive weight in Thailand. Yeah, what were some of the matches like for you, and where were they? So yeah, when I first uh, first went, I was nineteen, and I had I can't I don't know how many fights at the time, but I was. Uh, um, it, he didn't throw me in the deep end because there's so there's so much talent um, in Thailand. So I think the first match he had, he just wanted to see me fight and see what it was like and adjustments. Uh, so I fought out in outside of MBK Stadium, uh, sorry the shopping center, so not the stadium. Um, and then he got me a match. Uh, him and and um, I think it was Mister Mister Pitt um, had connections in the stadium, so he got me a match at Lumpini, and I fought a French guy. Then he uh, he just really well matched it and got me incrementally more difficult bouts each time. And once he was seeing my style and things like that, and then the trainers, I worked as hard as I could when I was training at his gym and tried to turn up for every session, never skip a session and uh, absorb as much as I could. And I think the trainers, um, it took it takes a while and then they started to respect that. So they, they, they saw that I was trying to work hard. So they put, put more energy into me. And I think they liked me as well because... I was a skinny, pale white kid, so uh, I never looked very good. So they would always <laughs> get a lot of money on the betting <laughs> if they bet on me. Because uh, I, I, yeah, I only had, uh, I think I was there seven months. Uh, and I think I had five fights in that seven months. And um, I won I won them all. They only, only my last fight was at a, deep, at a fairly good level um, in Rajanamnam. That was the second fight I had in Rajanamnam Stadium. Um, yeah. And what was the purse size for that second fight in Raja Demnan? Do you remember? <laughs> yeah, like uh, 1,500 baht. So. Yeah, so <laughs> not, not super high. <laughs> no. no. But, you know, it's, it's always good experience. And I do think you're right. It takes time for the ties to sort of develop connections with you to sort of respect you as well. So many people just come in and out all the time. As always, if you'd like to follow me, you can do so on Instagram, Matt Lucas Muay Thai. I always respond to messages there. I also have the website, matt-lucas.com, or email me at a period matt period lucas at gmail.com. Thanks to all the people that have supported me so far, sharing the podcast, leaving reviews. If you'd like to leave a review, that would be super helpful. You can do so on the iTunes stores. After years of hard work, studying, and being in the game, I publish On Fighting in Thailand, a guide to the sport in the motherland. is a Muay Thai encyclopedia. It goes over scoring, matchmaking, picking gym, fight styles, gambling, Muay Thai culture, and more. It contains a series of interviews with long-term expat fighters, including Michael Savas, Willie Whipple, Lisa Brealey, Angela Chang, and others. It is a great guide educates and helps guide careers by helping safe fighters from costly mistakes. It is 
a definitive guide and is available on Amazon as an ebook and in print. So go check it out. I'm fighting in Thailand, a guide to the sport in the motherland. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it must be exhausting. Yeah. Because obviously now, I've I've never had my own gym, but as a as a coach, it's exhausting putting time and energy into people, especially for very short periods of time for them to come and go. So I, I totally understand why they do it, and also, um, I think the more I do Thai boxing, the more I try um trying to understand its full essence, and I think like it must be frustrating for the Thais, Thai coaches to have foreigners who don't understand. So I, I get yeah. I get why they uh yeah fully understand uh, why uh, they would be hes- hesitant. Mm-hmm. And then uh, after your uh, seven month stint in Thailand, you returned to the UK to finish up your sports science degree, correct? Yeah, uh, to start it actually. Um, and were you yeah. actively fighting at the time as well? Yeah, yeah, I was. Um, yes, I was. Yeah. So I fought uh, the whole way through my degree up until the last three months when I needed to focus a bit more time on my uh, dissertation. And uh, I had a very tough decision towards the end. I had an opportunity to fight Sanchai in Ireland in, um, I think, I can't remember, Dublin. I can't remember where it was, but uh, Neptune Stadium. Yeah. Uh, But I had to uh, turn that down. I decided to turn that down. Yeah. Because uh, it's expensive. These degrees are expensive, man. So. uh, so I focused on that. I actually won a world title while I was in university. When um, I was fighting on the undercards of the Explosions show at the O2 in the UK, the main event was supposed to be Kieran Kedal versus um, Pratt, Pratt, Pratt Saw Tentacle. And uh, Kieran was training at Mike's gym and got a virus um, like a week or so before. So the offer came to um move up in weight slightly and fight uh Pratchett. So I took um took that one. Um uh, yeah, took took that opportunity and I didn't realise how good a boxer Pratchett was, so he knocked me down in the first or second yeah. round. I don't remember much of the fight after that to be honest. Uh I was just uh because uh, I, I was trying to put pressure on because I didn't know how fit he was. I didn't think he was super fit. So I was just kicking, knee in, and clinch. So march forward, kick, knee, clinch, kick, knee, clinch, and trying to stay out of his hand range. And I think uh, I won the fight on, yeah, I just tied him down. And uh, But I don't, I don't remember anything past the second round, actually. Yeah. Um, and that was a bit later in your career. But one of your, obviously, the one I definitely remember is the Pepunchu fight. Uh, what was that like? Because you fought him in the UK. What was going on at the time? How was that fight experience? Yeah, so I'd had a, a couple losses just before I fought him, actually. So Yeah, um, yeah just the two losses, correct? Yeah, uh, no, I have lost four times in total. So I lost my first ever fight um, to, to Sam Hewitt from Lumpini Crawley on points. I didn't really know how to train at the time, so I was unfit and whatever. And it was close, so whatever. And then um, this uh, the second loss I fought was uh, against a, a Thai who was in um, he was in Tenerife in Spain, and he was just a better point scorer. Spain had a kickboxing referee, so he exploited that. So he kind of exploited that the referee didn't know the rules at all, and uh, he <laughs> plowed me. Yeah, he caught my leg, plowed me halfway across the ring, like a big ring, and then kicked me in the head as I was falling over. So. He gave me an eight count there, and then I was chasing the fight after that. But then I had uh, I was supposed to fight the um, who before he was big in glory, um, Sergey Adamchuk from Mike's gym. So I was supposed to fight him, and then um, I think a week or so before he got injured, so they replaced him with Christian Christian Bay or Chris Bayer from also from Mike's gym. So he was a bit he was a one or two weight classes bigger, and he somehow I don't know if he managed to get down or not, but. He got down to weight. And anyway, I just uh, got caught with a right hand in the first round, I think. So I frustrated with myself on that fight because I, I think I should have, I could have won if I just kept it long and kicked and moved. But uh, instead, I was too eager to get into sort of the elbow and knee range and got caught with a right hand. So he knocked me out in this first. 
Then about five, six, or maybe five or six weeks later, I fought Pac on on the um, Yokao show. Um, I lost on points there. Pac on was just very slippery. He played the game really, really good lesson in um, how to just play the games and and uh, small adjustments and be smooth. And he was great. And then um, I was frustrated with myself though because I didn't feel like I fought as well as I could have. So then I went to fight Pet Boon Chu up in uh, Scotland. It, I knew it was his first fight outside of Thailand, I think, at the time, uh, if that was correct. But um, I was also just frustrated with myself for the losing twice in a row. And then um, my coach was, my main coach was ill. So Bill, he was been suffering from health problems for a while. So he hadn't been training me for a bit. And David was, was training me once a week. So I was trained by my uh, teammates. And uh, they did an amazing job, man. We just sort of created a, a great uh, atmosphere. And I ended up just fighting him and going, yeah, using guard changes, different stance, not not playing into the Thai style of scoring that way, trying to really jump on him quickly. And I caught him with that elbow early on, which helped a lot. I was a bit too eager to get the finish, so I didn't manage to stop him in the fir or first, I think it was, yeah. It took him. It took one or two rounds to recover, and then three and four, he came on strong. And I think it was close, a pretty competitive but that early knockdown had given me a slight head start there. Yeah. So, uh, yes, I beat him. Yeah. Um, and then you just had like another, uh, final fight against ring rot, Sasuke Prapa. Um, after that, and you stopped because of, uh, CT things, correct? Yeah. Part of the reason. Yeah. That was part of the reason. So, um, the last two years I was fighting, um, I had like four, four big fights got canceled. So uh, initially, I was supposed to fight Pacorn, and and um, he didn't get his visa and didn't make it there. But the promoters only told me the day before the weigh-in, so that was a big letdown. So oh. financially, I lost out a lot there. Then the second fight, I was supposed to fight Liam uh, Liam Harrison, and that uh, like we talked about, that happened. That didn't happen, and I yeah didn't get paid for that. And I put like I was putting everything into each of these fights, like all my finances into like getting prepared as best I could, and uh stopping working as much so that was that one then the third one that didn't happen was um sanchai i was supposed to fight sanchai um and then i injured my rib a week before um and then six or eight weeks later i was fighting on lion fight in connecticut in foxwoods casino against tetsuya yamoto and that's when i failed my mri scan because the American system requires MRIs. So I kind of took it like, uh, I kind of just took it from science, you know, science from the universe. Like if I had fought Sanchai and he'd kicked me in my head, maybe I had this previous injury, uh, this brain injury, which then it could have been game over. Also, I had these four big fights, which I financially I was struggling by not um, earning and putting all my everything into it. And then uh, cutting weight became an issue. I was cutting... I grew, I obviously grew since I was 16, but I fought at the same weight class. So I was, I was cutting away a lot of weight and I wasn't doing it. I didn't have a team of nutritionists or whatever around me. I was just doing it quite badly there. So, um, so I was cutting a lot of weight, uh, in not very healthy ways. So that was like leading to like disordered eating, binge eating, eating disorders. Like that was making me unhappy. I just got a, a girlfriend, uh, a partner at the time that, um, it was with, uh, and uh, that relationship was very hard. She she was great. She's been amazing. Uh, we were together for like six and a half years after that or whatever. So that so like having a partner then not the finances the the weight cutting and then uh, the brain injury. So I was just caught, took all of those all of those things as a bit of a sign. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that makes sense. Uh, so obviously you've transitioned into a post fight career though. Uh, what has that been like in, you know, your move to the U S how, how have you been dealing with that? Can you talk about that a little bit? Yeah. Yeah. I'd say, I'd say it's, it's definitely hasn't been a smooth transition. Um, and it was very tough for a few years, but, um, the first couple years, I just wanted to focus on my health. So I wanted to stop yo-yo, yo-yoing and weight up and down, get a better relationship with my, uh, eating. Because I, I think there's a lot of fighters that have eating disorders and coaches as well. Uh, and I think it's just, you know, masculinity and bravado, we kind of hide behind it and joke about it, but it's, it's quite there. So that took a couple years. Um, I also needed a year of no contact and no head contact at all, no sparring. Uh, 
uh, that was recommended. And then by that point, I'd also parted ways with my coach, Bill Judd. So he was a huge uh, figure in my life for a long time. And that was pretty upsetting and whatever at the time. He was a big like, yeah, father figure, mentor. So parting ways with him, uh, trying to figure out, I don't know about you, but I see like when you're when you're fighting at a high level, when you're putting everything into it, you don't really, like you don't really plan ahead. Um, and I wasn't anyway. I wasn't planning that far ahead. Um, I wasn't really sure which way I wanted to go. I wasn't sure. I can't because because Thai boxing had sort of I suppose it had damaged me in, in a few ways. I wasn't sure if I wanted to continue that much. I didn't. I'm not sure how at the time. I didn't share. I didn't know. I'm not sure how I felt about training people to fight when I'd had an injury like that and it, you know so it was a bit conflicting uh I did some traveling I still worked I still worked uh as a coach and stuff and I was doing other bits as well but um I was working as a tree surgeon with my brother he's got a tree surgery company and then uh yeah transitioning wise and then a few years later I worked in different gyms different environments taught a bit of boxing taught a bit there I, I, I love fitness and health I like helping people I've got a corporate um company I'm a part of where we teach the lessons from uh, different athletic careers and bring it into the workplace, things like that. Um, I'd like to do more community projects at some point. I'd like to get that going. But um, so now um, um, I stopped at 25. I'm 30, 30 about to turn 31. Uh, I moved to the States about 18 months ago just because uh, uh, my, my partner at the time, she grew up here, so she wanted to come back. I wanted to change. Uh, just I was in the comfort zone of my own city. So... Um, so that was it, really. Yeah, I came out here. I wanted to test myself as well. Uh, it's it's all well and good being, uh, you know, growing up and being in the same place. So I wanted to to experience that. And then I moved here just before the pandemic, so it was a bit of a, a bit of a dud start. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. It's definitely hard. You know, I was talking uh, to Carnage today, uh, Nathan Corbett, and he uh, he moved over to the states maybe three years ago, and just immigrating is difficult. It's very, very difficult to move to a different country. Um, but just uh, sort of wrapping things up, uh, is there anything that you wanted to talk about that we didn't get a chance to talk about? Uh, in the context of UK Muay Thai? Yeah, in the context of UK Muay Thai and also, you know, any additional topics that you thought were maybe important we didn't bring up? Uh, probably just the change. I'd say the change um, that I've noticed is, is the influence of social media. So um, when I first started, there was the biggest thing was Axe, Axe Kickboxing Forum, which was an online forum. Yeah. So Rob was all over. Yeah, him. yeah. Yeah, he was spitting facts and putting people straight, left, right, and center. Yeah. <laughs> but um, I'd yeah. say, yeah, it was, it was, I'd say that Thai boxing is an interesting one because maybe more then and less now, but um, it meant that the fans had direct access to the fighters. So there was a lot of sort of fans criticizing fighters and fighters criticizing fighters and a lot of sort of there was it was useful for like uh events dates results pictures all of this stuff people gambling as well but there was a lot of sort of uh yeah uh that stuff going on and i would say that um now social media has changed the game quite a lot in that uh people if you if they use that tool very well they they have a bigger profile and they're getting themselves good matches because of that so um when i was fighting I, I didn't really have any social media i didn't take uh the style of my gym and bill my coach didn't really like any of that so he didn't like anyone filming or pictures and all of this so there wasn't any of that and you just fought and it was more for fighting whereas now um mma is bigger there's a lot more um people glam it's, it's more glamorizing to call yourself a fighter uh, or more glamorous, sorry. And I think that's that's changed the game a lot. I think there's also like uh, younger fighters are doing really well on promoting themselves. And even me, it kind of fools me sometimes. Like I'm watching people on their Instagrams and things, and then uh, when I see them fight and they're losing to no name people or whatever, it's it's interesting. Or vice versa, you know, you can see a talent early on and they're documenting their journeys a lot more. So I, I'd say that's been a very interesting change uh in the fight game yeah i'd say uh and building people's profiles getting them opportunities and i'd say yeah it's uh it's interesting to see you obviously you work within this firsthand so it'd be interesting to hear what you think but almost like now it's a necessity of the of the sport to have these 
um, unless you're very, very good, you need you need that social media presence. Yeah, I mean, you do. Uh, obviously, the landscape of the states is a bit different. Um, is very much a pay to play model here in the states. You need to sell tickets. Uh, the way you're right, able right, to sell right. tickets is, you know, obviously it's your connections within your own community. You know, you're you have to be nice to people. Uh, one of my favorite things that Liam Harrison was like said that you know a big reason for his success is he just tries not to be a dick. Uh, so, and I find that generally you need to be nice to people. Um, then the you know you're able to also use your social media to grow your profile, but not every fighter has those tools and not every fighter wants to use them. So it's, it can be a bit difficult. Sometimes fighters that are very good at social media get opportunities that they might not otherwise have or deserve, um, which, you know, it creates an uneven playing field, but you know, the, the playing field in general is not always fair and that's, that's life, you know? Yeah. 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 That's life. That's life. Yeah. Yeah. I say that, but that's no, that's just the only thing I've sort of been noticing, which has changed quite a lot since when, um, not, yeah, obviously not even that long ago, I was, but when I was first fighting, that's, that was been quite a lot. Yeah. Well, um, thank you for your time. If people are interested in following along with you or training with you, how can they get a hold of you? Ah, uh, social media. Yeah. So, um, yeah. <laughs> There you go. Plugging myself. Thank you. Um, Greg underscore Wooten on, on Instagram. Um, yeah, they can mostly follow me there. Okay, great. Well, I appreciate you taking your time out. No problem. Yeah, likewise. Thanks for having me on here. So that concludes the interview with Greg. It was great to talk to him. I also got a chance to meet up with him while I was in L.A. recently. I was able to interview him there as well, just about building his profile as a coach, building his profile out here in the States. The States definitely need people like Greg, very, very experienced fighters that have been in the game for a long time. One of the other added advantages of Greg particularly is that he's still young. He's still able to hold pads. He's still able to do a lot of the physical things that some older trainers won't be able to do. So it's, I think it's gonna be a real boon to American Muay Thai to have him in the States. I'm excited about his future. And again, things should go back on track uh, in terms of the podcast release now that I'm back in Thailand and getting back into the swing of things. So thank you so much as always for listening. Hope to have our next episode out in about two weeks. Thank you as always for listening. And once again, if you like this show and if you like the content, it would be great if you could share, uh, leave a review on iTunes and really support the show and what I'm doing here. If you'd like to reach me, you can follow me on Instagram at Lucas Muay Thai or email me at a period Matt period Lucas at gmail.com. As always, this has been On Fighting in Thailand, the best news and analysis covering the economics and infrastructure of Muay Thai. I'm Matt Lucas, journalist, commentator, and ex-Muay Thai fighter. Make stronger fighters, make stronger people. This show was edited by Effie Ceruti. You can find me on Instagram at Effie underscore FC or on Facebook at Effie Ceruti. 